Welcome to another look at the twos review as we look back at the 2-2 draw between Memphis 901 FC and Atlanta United 2. Memphis 901 FC came in losing three of their last four, including their last two at home. The last win they actually had was against Atlanta United 2 back on Wednesday, June 16th. You'll remember that was the madness after 90-plus when Mark Segbers actually finished the match for John Berner and Nett and Atlanta United uh, two was trying to get an equalizer, ended up losing 1-0. It was the, the last win Memphis 901 had. They lost 1-0 to OKC Energy and Lee Viedman, and they also lost 3-2 to Sporting Kansas City, two at AutoZone Park back on the 26th. So they were busy a week ago. Then they come into Fifth Third Bank Stadium and take on Atlanta United 2. Atlanta United 2 had attempted to play midweek, but they only got 45 minutes in before uh, BBVA Field turned unplayable thanks to the weather in central Bur in central Alabama. And uh, Mother Nature forced the third postponement for Birmingham Legion this season. So at some point, Atlanta United 2 is going to have to go back and take on Birmingham Legion at BBVA Field. So coming in, it was you know Atlanta United 2 and Memphis 901, Jarrett Smith uh, alongside for the 2's review. Your opening thoughts and your, uh, on what happened here over the last 90 minutes. I don't know what the hell happened over the last nine minutes. <laughs> um, it was a chaotic game. Um, I think uh, Jack Collison said it best. Like, this is a great game if you were neutral. A um, lot of action, a lot of weird decisions. You had dueling red cards at the end of the first half that no one really knew why they happened. One of them you understood, the other one you didn't. Then no. Alec Can I think got a yellow for. It was Rocco for descent. Was how that was that was that ended oh, up. Oh, Rocco got the yeah, yellow. It, okay, yeah, Rocco Rocco Rios Novo. It was it was twisted from Alec Can for being a part of the scrum to Rocco Rios Novo who was on the bench. So it was a yellow for him standing there, and I guess saying some things. Okay, sure. That makes more sense because both <laughs> keepers were in the scrum. So giving Can a yellow wouldn't make would make wouldn't make sense without giving Memphis's keeper a yellow as well. But it was a weird game. So at the first half, like you know, Atlanta starts out really well, looks really good. Memphis gets some opportunities. They get two goals in five minutes. Jack Collison talked about that was the uh, um, it was the first time you've really seen heads drop uh, the fifteen minutes after that first goal. Yes, you get the second goal. Um, just the ball bounces around, defending isn't clearing, isn't good enough, and you're in a situation there where you're down 2 nothing just before the half. Then things get weird. Atlanta United 2, though, digs in. They kind of scrap things at halftime because you're playing 10-on-10 10 10 at that point. Um, and they're able to get a goal off of a goalkeeper's mistake. Then you keep fighting, keep pushing. You get a penalty late, and you draw it at 2, which, hey, I mean, look, you want to win home games. I get it. When you're down 2 nothing at home and you come back and get that 2-2 two -two draw, that is a win in that book. We've talked about there are draws that feel like losses. That's a draw that feels like a win, all things considered. And you look at Atlanta United 2, and it's something that we've seen this season from Atlanta United 2. They're down. They've come back. They've, they've done it in Oklahoma City against OKC Energy early this year. And you're seeing fight in Atlanta United 2 where they're down, and whether it was under Tony Annan or under Jack Collison, you're seeing the fight in them for the entire 90 minutes, they come back because you never know when something can go your way, especially if you're a 16-year-old academy kid when you're down 2-0. Yeah, if you're a 16-year-old academy kid, um, Daniel Sabatu gets thrown into the fire a bit here. He's already playing up top, but he's got a guy like Benitez who's a really experienced player, really good player next to him. Well, Benitez gets sent off, so he's kind of up top by himself. And he he mentioned uh, post game that you know he's he's started to find that chemistry with Aiden McFadden. McFadden he knows is going to play in a good cross. He does. Keeper spills it. He's there to clean it up, put it in the back of the net, and boom, there's your lifeline. And that's the thing about being a striker. Sometimes is you're looking for those moments and you're looking to chase those moments. And you're going to risk some stuff because if the ball gets spilled, you're going to be there to clean it up. It's exactly what it was. Uh, but you know, look, Daniel's come through the academy. And, you know, he said after the game that coach got into him. Um, you know, he talked about just the fact that halftime Jack kind of got into me. He said, and when it comes against adults, you've got to step up. And there is no excuse. And that's the thing with these kids in this academy. They really seem to understand that there is no excuse of you're 16 and you're playing against adults who are doing this to put food on their table, which is something Daniel said. Um, it's an understanding of this is their job. You're trying to make it. This is their living. They're not going to take pity on you because you're a kid. 
And he talked about the need to step up there and being on your P's and Q's. Uh, said Jack expected more of me, and with him saying that, I knew he, he said he said with him saying that, I knew he meant it. Jack's been coaching him through the academy, so there's that established relationship already. But he took that moment tonight, and look, he's going to probably have to take that moment Wednesday night because there's no Benitez right now because of the red card. And that was an entirely different situation that happened at the end of the 45 where you have Mark Segbers and Matias Benitez uh, having a a bit of a disagreement. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Matias Benitez takes the ball, kind of launches it at Segbers. It's like, okay, go ahead and make your throw in. Yeah. And Segbers then all of a sudden takes it and rips it. (laughs) Kingpin. Yeah. I mean, literally, it's one of those where he's trying to make sure that he gets the – the uh, the uh, the third strike in the tenth frame, and by the time it's all sorted out, Segbers is off with a red. Benitez is off with a red. Rocco Rios Novo on the bench ends up with a yellow. You end up with ten v ten. And the point that to, one of the points that we were talking about on the air with uh, Jeff Lorenowitz in with color is that you now have more space to operate because you're at ten v ten. And when you have speed like Atlanta United can bring in, especially in that last 20 minutes, with guys like Darwin Mateus and Connor Stanley, who were fresh legs, going up against that back line of Memphis 901, you could create opportunities. And as it turned out, you got that last opportunity right there, right there at the deck. You did. And, you know, Jack talked about that at a, after halftime. He said, you know, we knew they were only going to press with one up top because the field is so opened up. Both teams are down to 10. So they took off Camden Fail. It wasn't a matter of Camden Fail performing poorly. It's we're going to play with the back three. We're going to put Connor Stanley on late. And we're going to make something happen. And that's what they were able to do. They uh, Also, according to Jack Collison, Atlanta had 571 passes tonight. So lots of passing, lots of possession. They dominated possession in this game. But again, they dominated the first chunk of the game. Memphis hits them on the counter a couple times, and Atlanta really lets their head drop. And then Atlanta really dominates the second half because at that point, both teams are down to two, down to 10, and Game State's going to dictate that Memphis is going to let Atlanta have the ball. They're going to try and hit on the counter, and they do put pressure on guys like Josh Bauer, who does such a good job in that sweeper role of using his physicality but also his smarts in terms of getting in position, being on the right shoulder of a guy, and you know, being able to shepherd the ball if he needs to, being able to kind of push his way around. I thought Josh Bauer continued to do a good job in those situations that you're going to be put in in this system and in this, in this club. If you're that last defender back, you're going to have a lot of pressure on you. You can't fold under it. I thought he's done a great job of not folding. And Jeff Lorenowitz was in with uh, me tonight on Color on ESPN+. Plus. Here's Jeff's thoughts on the match that included Josh Bauer. All right, so Jeff, uh, what we've seen from Atlanta United 2 this year, no quit, no quit, no quit, always trying to find a way to come back into the match, down 2-0 and 10-10, v they find a way to get a point. Yeah, playing playing with the 2's team is about learning, right? Learning at this professional level. I think that they, they go behind in games, the games that I've watched, and have to fight to get back. It, it's good that they are fighting back, but... I think the learning lesson on this one is you got to bring it from the start, especially against these these USL squads that are full of true professionals. When you look at you know Alec Can getting the start, that's so to get him some quality reps because Brad's going to go on Gold Cup duty. I know that uh, one of those, the first goal was you know with Bryce getting lost in his assignment with the ball going back. Alec Can, good to get him out there for 90 minutes to get him 90 minutes ready for this run coming up. Yeah, it's it's going to be hugely important because Brad could be gone for weeks and weeks. The USA in, in the Gold Cup, you know, they tend to go to the final. And and so that's lots of time that, that Brad's going to be away. And uh, You talk about that first goal for Alec, I, I'm sure he's not going to be very happy with himself. But at the same time, those are kind of the little moments you think about sharpness. Those, those are the reasons why you play in these games. And I think Alec has been playing really well in the games that I've, I've seen so far with the twos this year and, and should carry that in with the first team. And then let's talk about the back line. I know that one of the guys that we got to see who closed down a lot of stuff, especially in the final 45, was Josh Bauer. I mean, he really showed himself to be a force back there tonight against a lot of running that was coming at him from Memphis 901. Yeah, and, and we said we, we, we heard from Jack Collison saying that he's getting more reps with the first team and, and learning from that experience of training with them during the week. And it and shows um, he's not going to – He's not going to be the guy that you talk about a lot after this game. You're going to talk about the red card and, and the late goal, but 
you said it. He he closed people down and he was able to shut shut those attacks down, those counterattacks for Memphis, and it's it's been a good showing for him. What other takeaways do you have from the Atlanta United two match? You know, obviously it's the first in three matches in a week for them. Uh, you know, lineup probably looked a little different. Connor Stanley comes in, gives you a 20-minute sprint. Same for Mateus comes in, gives you, I think, 30 for a sprint as well to get them ready for that quick turn coming back midweek. What other takeaways do you have? Well, I think there's going to be times, especially when you're playing more and more frequently, where you're going to be tired. You might not have the ball. You might be tired mentally. But you've got to win those physical battles early on, and, and they didn't do that tonight. So hopefully going through the week, th- they'll have – that in the back of their mind sometimes we got to make it ugly sometimes we got to win those 50 50s and those duels to get then get on the ball and be on the front foot but overall it's good a good fight back for the twos and uh a big week coming up how would you grade your promotional read from the evening i would say b minus maybe a little bit of a stutter in the middle so i'm going to keep working on those so that's the thoughts of big red tonight final numbers are in what sticks out in your mind Honestly, part of it is because we talked to Robbie Mertz, but just the midfield, the midfield cohesion of this team. Um, Jack Collison, you know, talked about the most pleasing thing to come off as a coach is the timing of movement. When it comes to guys like Riley and Allen, the way they move in that midfield, the way their chemistry gels, and then, you know, Robbie Mertz talked about it as well in the way that they play. And Jack Collison was very complimentary of Mertz in the fact that, you know, he makes a lot of unselfish runs. They want to get him on the score sheet and get him going. But kind of juxtaposed against the fact that he does a lot of unselfish things that aren't going to lead to goals. That's not necessarily a bad thing. As far as final numbers from them, uh, you have Will Riley with one shot, uh, had a chance created, passed it 93%. Robbie Mertz passed it 87%, but created two chances. They both drew two fouls. Um, else in the midfield, you had Chris Allen, who... Uh, actually, I say they missed. They missed. Oh, he had a shot off target because he did pull the trigger from distance. Yes. Uh, but Chris Allen passed at ninety percent. This midfield has gelled really nicely, and it's a damn shame though that it looks like Wednesday is going to be Will Riley's last game for Atlanta United two before he goes off to school. All right, let's take a look at some of the other numbers. You look at the the duels, and it was uh, another number that we talked about on air on ESPN Plus. Just because, frankly, because when you have a backline at six three six three six four. You're going to have the, the duels end up the way that they were. Uh, percentage is 57. Uh, basically, it's like 60-40 when it came to, to duels percentage. It looks like it was 31-21 total uh, when it comes to, to full time. Looking at total shots, including blocks full time, it looks like it was 6-5. That's, oh, that's your halftime numbers. Okay, so see, this is what happens when I'm looking at halftime numbers as opposed to like actual numbers numbers. <laughs> So we don't have full time. We don't have full time numbers. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. But anyway, I mean, you, you talk about you. You got into the discussion about the, the guys in the midfield, uh, and I think that when you have, you know, Atlanta United working their way through, you you mentioned that cohesion that was there. Riley could help out, work his way, drop back, be engaged in the play when he was necessary, help back defensively. Robbie Mertz, you mentioned how he is when it comes to getting engaged in the play and trying to get on the score sheet. He was trying to, to work his way through on the one-on-one battles, especially on the edge, try to work and cut the ball of the inside top of the six and the, and the 18 occasionally. So we saw a lot of different things from Robbie Mertz tonight in trying to get him on the score sheet. We did, and, you know, Robbie Mertz also, you know, talked about being on the same page tactically with these guys. That I think our tactics have been spot on every game. Right, Will Riley will be missed because the, between the three of them, he thinks they're really gelling. Um, he said, you know, we came into this game honestly, we knew we were the better team coming into this game, and we were on the front foot. Uh, what we showed, I think, was a lack of maturity, especially in that 15 minute stretch. And Jack Collison felt the same way. He's referred to as naivete at times yes. with his young kids, and that's just something that's going to happen. Um, you know, Robbie Mertz, though, who came to Atlanta United to, uh, system and said as much that you know he is here to get a chance at the first team. He's going to do everything he can to make that a reality. Uh, but he said, I've been pretty blown away by the kids in the academy who come up and play at this level. And he said, I don't think the league gets the credit it deserves, meaning USL Championship. Right. And it's a tough level. Um, but said so it was awesome to see guys come out here uh, doing exactly what Jack expects, and in that case, you're talking about Daniel uh, Sebatu. Yeah, when you when you look Sabatu. at yeah when you look at a 16 year old who comes in and is basically thrown into the fire. He, yeah. he played in the first 45 minutes in the un game in Birmingham back mm-hmm. midweek, and it looked like the he, un game. Well, yes, that's it, what it was. 
Yeah, it is a game that does not exist. In the 45 minutes that he played that won't count, it looked like Sabatu grew into the game in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And he was becoming more and more comfortable with being thrown into the fire. You know, tonight we saw Caleb Wiley working his way forward. I mean, he was a forward. He was listed as a forward in the, in the, note, in the note card. Go look at the, go watch those first 15 minutes again. And Caleb Wiley was a problem on the left-hand side. It was a it was a lot of fun to watch him. He he had a in the first maybe ten minutes, you know, he has one chance where he gets in behind the defense, plays a ball back that Mertz puts over the bar. A couple minutes later, he gets in, creates a corner kick. Um, you know, Caleb Wiley in an advanced role, it's a lot of fun in that situation. With Camden Fayo playing behind him, who is comfortable in those positions, playing you know on the on the left or right back. And it gives Wiley, I think, that ability to stay up the field. At times when Camden Fayo gets forward, though, you know, Riley is going to have to be on his P's and Q's mentally about making sure that, you know, he is tracking anyone. Because Camden Fayo doesn't just retreat. You know, he's going to pick somebody up and try and pressure the ball while the defense kind of reassesses itself. Um, but, yeah, I was very impressed with what we saw from Caleb Wiley. And um, you, you talked about the substitutes. Very impressed with what we saw from them as well, where you've got guys like Connor Stanley coming in. Um, you know, Darrell Mateus. Mm-hmm. Really was kind of finding himself, I think, for the last few games. Found himself tonight, drew a penalty. We weren't sure it was a penalty. Yeah. Ref wasn't sure it was a penalty. His AR told him it was a penalty. And then no, uh, it was a penalty. And it was a penalty. And I posted it on my Twitter. Um, and I know the team has it on theirs as well. A cold blooded penalty with almost the last kick of the match mm-hmm. to run up at full speed and just casually. A little bit of Joseph in there. A little bit of Joseph in there and just casually places it into the opposite corner, gets the keeper leaning the wrong way. Lady had two steals to draw. And with Alec Can, notice, you know, knowing full well that with Alec, with Brad Gazan on Gold Cup duty, it was important for Alec to get some minutes and get basically game rate, uh, game reps in game state so he can be prepared for Nashville coming up on Thursday. And, you know, we mentioned the 20 minutes for Stanley and Mateus. You're looking at a quick turn and you're looking at Indy 11 in the midweek. And yep. then you're looking at Sporting Kansas City, too. So you're looking at three matches in a week here. All of them are in the Central Division. And there are some points to be had here before you go to Lou City on the 17th. Who's going to be looking for revenge? Yeah. And so you're looking at three matches at home in quick succession and then Lou City. And so I understand, I think, kind of why you had Mateus and Stanley on the bench getting ready for this Indy 11 match in the midweek. But when you call on them to do 20 minutes and they come in and have the impact that they have running at tired legs, you end up with that late chance that we saw with the penalty. It's going to be very interesting to see how this goes because with guys starting to make those decisions if they're going to go to school or not, now you're going to get a little bit tighter in this midfield. How does the midfield shape out? Do you see you know, like an Abdullah Job? Do you see um, do you see more of a Johnny Fortune getting in there? And um, you know Jack Collison was very complimentary of him tonight because remember it was Fortune who gets a red card in Memphis. Mm-hmm. He gets called into this game in the second half to come into a game that's already really tense. Um, referee is clearly already shown he's going to use cards to control it. And then Johnny Fortune just plays such a good game and such a great bounce-back effort from him. That's the quick turn, but before we go, here's a look at the highlights as they were officially cut by our friends here at Kennesaw State, courtesy of the USL Championship and YouTube. Riley on Damaduro, who tries to spin away and get away from that mark, gives to Reynolds. Cutting lines, looking for Murphy. Alec can aggressive, too aggressive. Can Murphy put it in? Yes, he can. It's 1-0 Memphis, 9-0-1. It's a terrific run and pass. Kyle Murphy in behind. Him and Mitch Guitar aren't going to give up all night long. They're going to chase you defensively, and when it turns over, they're going to run in the attack. Right here, gets a little touch around Alec Can is able to finish into the empty net. It's a good goal. It's an all-effort goal. They're going to run after you. They're going to make you turn it over, and it only takes one or two passes. for the- Into the middle. Thought about Kissy do. Bryce Washington there to intercept. But Leston Paul there gets it away from Will Riley. Memphis 901 will try it again. Off to the left, Kissiadu. Top of the six, Paul. Again, another goal on the board. It's Murphy with a brace two times in six minutes. Memphis, 901 FC, up 2 0 at Fifth Third Bank Stadium. Two on the board in five minutes' time. Yeah, it started with the turnover in the center with, with Will Riley, and it falls to Murphy. Like I said, you give him an opportunity in the box, he's going to put it away. It's a block shot. 
Falls right to him. Riley turns on guitar. Give to Mertz. Give and go. Riley tries to cut it back. Guitar interrupts it. Pass is not out of trouble. Bryce Washington is there. McFadden looks to go on Andre Reynolds, sends it into the area. Brady Scott misplayed it, and there in. it is. Daniel Sabatu picks up the loose change. Brady Scott is hot. To the back post, missed clearance, comes off Gonzalez. Sabatu's first to react. I said it about Kyle Murphy in the first half. He's going to be the forward that's just looking for the knockdowns. He's going to be opportunistic. And now it's Sabatu, young kid getting to step in, pull his team back into the game. Going to be an interesting step for Mateus as he tries to get it in the back of the net with very little time. On the clock! Darwin Mateus earns the penalty at the edge of the area, puts it in the back of the net pass, Brady Scott. Just a little hop there to make the goalkeeper lean, and he puts it in the corner. So that's your 2-2 draw with Atlanta United 2, Memphis 901 FC. We mentioned once again on the 7th in the midweek. It's Indy 11 here at the Fraction. And then a week from Saturday, a week from Saturday night, Sporting Kansas City 2 comes to the Fraction as well for two big matchups. Three matchups in a week for Atlanta United. The losing streak stops at 2 with the 2-2 draw. Now Atlanta United on goal difference is in fifth place in the Central Division ahead of OKC Energy. So uh, last thoughts from you, Jared Smith. Another tough game, uh, th- another time that this team has shown some cojones. Uh, they are not backing down. Jack Collison got handed a tough situation, let's be honest. I mean, he came in middle of the season. Um, you know, uh, Robbie Mertz talked about said the tactics are simple but not too simple. They're the right situation for a coach coming in, even though he knows these players and knows this system. It's worked well, and you haven't gotten necessarily the wins you want to see but those are coming with these performances because you have some impressive wins. Don't get me wrong. I think the next step is to see those 15-minute mo- uh, fifteen minute steps of kind of naivete go away and start turning these draws into wins. And I think that is coming with this squad. And we'll see that with the two matches coming up in a week's time. He's Jared. I'm John. That's your twos review. Thanks for hanging out with us here at SDH.